Rwanda is a small, lush country in the heart of Africa, but few know it for its beauty. Most only know it for one thing, the 1994 genocide. One million people dead, and the dead bodies were scattered all over. It is as if Rwanda experienced 3-9-11 every day for 100 days. It's an event that forever changed the country, and in many ways, still defines it. But when documentary filmmaker Trevor Meyer went on his first trip there a few years ago, he was confronted with a very different Rwanda. It was not at all what I expected. I expected, you know, post-1994, all the images that I'd seen of Rwanda were about the genocide and about the devastation that happened. I expected to see a lot of that. There's definitely still remnants, but there's kind of this transformation that seems to be happening all over the place. The big question was, how did this happen? What was behind this transformation? Trevor knew this was a story worth telling. When a million people are killed, uh, I think that's a story that automatically grabs my interest just as a human being. Um, but beyond that, other countries in Africa have seen a similar, similar amount of devastation, Sierra Leone or, or uh, Somalia. But Rwanda, for some reason, has been able to make a turnaround, to make a, a recovery. It's not complete. It's not nowhere near complete. But for some reason, people have been able to pick up the pieces. So Trevor and a group of friends went to Rwanda to piece the story together. It's the ultimate in indie production, uh, small scale, um, running around Africa, jammed into a Hilux truck with uh, me and my friends. and. Uh, we, we were passionate about the story and we said, you know, it's worth it to us to sacrifice our time and our money to do this. So we, we didn't know what would come of it, but we made the effort. The result was Rwanda Hope Rises, a one-hour documentary that tells the incredible story of the reconciliation and rebuilding of a nation scarred by genocide. When you hit rock bottom, there's only one way to go up. And Rwanda hit the very bottom of anything I can think of. The story is told by Rwandans, those impacted by the disaster and those offering hope to the nation. One of those people is Nicholas Hitamana. His wife is a Tutsi, he was a Hutu, and they uh, went through a very difficult time during the genocide, miraculously escaped and left hoping never to return. The genocide continued to have a major influence on their life and it started to pull the threads of their family apart. And the forgiveness process that they had to go through as, as a family, I think, represents what needs to happen in Rwanda. Another player in the rebuilding efforts is Richard Taylor, executive director of the Wellspring Foundation. Raised in Africa, he had seen Rwanda in the aftermath of the genocide. I was absolutely blown away by what I saw. There were bodies all littering the pews. Um, there were skulls. Um, people's belongings. Um, I remember walking out of the church and, and feeling like I was going to throw up. And the whole world felt like it was, it was spinning. Um, and I'll never forget that moment. Wellspring is dedicated to quality Christian education, one of the biggest needs in Rwanda right now, according to Taylor. When we looked at Rwanda and the opportunities that existed there to make a difference in rebuilding the country, the thing that kept coming back to us, that God kept bringing to our hearts, was the vision that local people had for quality Christian education. Uh, at the type of education that could make a difference in a generation of people, uh, to help them to escape poverty, yes, but also the hatred. There is a long history of hatred in Rwanda, especially between the two predominant tribes, the Hutus and Tutsis. It's what fueled the genocide and what could have shaped the future. History is something in Rwanda that uh, has been written differently by, by different people. A big part of changing hearts and minds happens in the classroom, and that's why Wellspring also invests in teacher training. There's a man named Fred Buyinza said, teachers are more precious than gold to the nation. And I really believe that. Teachers are the culture carriers of the nation. Every teacher in Rwanda, um, even if they have a career that spans 15 to 20 years, will have the opportunity to teach uh, hundreds, maybe thousands of young minds. 
Education is one example of the hope rising in Rwanda, but it's not what is behind the transformation. The people, mostly, who are finding healing are those who believe in what Christ has done for them. They realize that they themselves do not deserve forgiveness for what they have done, and therefore when they look at someone who has committed some of the worst atrocities, the worst murder, the forgiveness of Christ in their own hearts allows them to forgive other people. Sadly, some churches played a role in the genocide, but many more churches are playing a part in rebuilding the country, especially the identity of Rwandans. Africans in general, and Rwandans in particular, have suffered is a feeling of inferiority, that maybe they're worth less, and the world has certainly given them that impression. My desire to tell this story has a lot to do with um, understanding that we are all God's creation, that as human beings we're all equals um, in our value. And as a Westerner, I've been brought up with the understanding that what I have to offer, what I bring to the table, is the basis for my value, and that's not true in God's economy. Reconciliation has also come through the courts, although currently 90,000 people are still awaiting trial for war crimes. Meyer says the government is responding with a made in Rwanda solution called the Gachacha Courts. The people in a community will try others who committed genocide. They'll collect evidence together, they pick people from within the community to be the judges, and then they move uh, through the whole process, collectively getting evidence, collectively telling the story, and then collectively bringing the, the uh, perpetrators in front of the community where they have a chance to confess their crimes and be forgiven by the community, by the whole community together. Most Rwandans aren't waiting for the final verdict. They're too busy getting on with life. Growing up in Africa, I'm used to hearing a lot of excuses. Um, and there are a lot of reasons to have excuses. And yet to see a country that 12 years ago was completely obliterated, it wasn't even a country anymore, uh, be at the place of saying, listen, we're not going to make excuses about the past. We have things that we can do in order to move forward is extremely inspiring. And that inspiration carries Hope Rises. Meyer has been showing clips of the documentary to Western audiences. I think this does give Rwandans a voice because in a in a society where Africa is kind of viewed as a, a lesser citizen, I think anytime you bring it up to people in a way that doesn't show them as, as needing our help but as equals, I think it really provides an opportunity for people to hear their voice. Meyer says he hopes the documentary will raise the profile of Rwanda in the West. And there's no better way to do that than through storytelling. The Oscar-nominated film Hotel Rwanda told one man's play to survive the genocide while well, retired General Romeo Dallaire's book, Shake Hands with the Devil, told his first-hand account of the world's failure to intervene. Oh, yeah. Hope yes. Rises is another chapter in the larger story of Rwanda, one that may just have a happy ending. I don't think that it's impossible for genocide to happen again. I think it could happen again. But there's a unique point in Rwanda's history right now where if people are willing to take a stand and take the initiative, and put the effort into reconciling their people and rebuilding a hopeful future that it really will be a model nation for other countries to look to. And in the meantime, there's a lot of rebuilding to do. <laughs> Considering that 40% of the population is under the age of 14, there is hope Rwanda may just have a fresh start. The fact that so many people in the country are under the age of 15 uh, is extremely significant that it, it does represent an opportunity to be able to impact the minds of those who have not been so calloused and affected by what has happened in the country. And Meyer is hoping to impact the hearts and minds of audiences around the world. I think in story people can see bits and pieces of their own lives and in story it speaks a heart language rather than just the mind and that's really what uh, can move people to change. And I think that's for the power of this story, that this is a power, the power of change, the, the power of transformation inside a life, what it can do to completely transform from pure evil that we saw in 1994 to a hopeful future that we'll hopefully see in Rwanda from now on. In Burlington, Ontario, Denise Lottie, 100 Huntley Street.